Wow, I love that song. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another Wednesday night edition of the PM Show. I am one of your dynamic hosts, Miss Mandy Parsons, and with me I have your other dynamic host, Mr. John Moreland. Welcome, John Moreland. How's it going? It's going well. You having some throat problems there? <clears throat> no, just had to make sure it's unmuted. Certainly unmuted. Right in the middle of, of Ray Harrison's song there. Oh, did you hear me clear my throat? I did. You were getting all professional oh, and ready sorry for about a that. great episode. That is okay. We have a fantastic two hours tonight. I I am stoked for this week. Um, very excited. You've been doing a great job loading our shows um, to get ready for the Thursday show on the Voluntary Virtues Network. So keep up the great work. Uh, I'm doing what I can. You're doing a great job. So just want to remind everybody that tonight is Wednesday, of course. It is 7 p.m. here on the East Coast. So we broadcast on Wednesdays at freedomizerradio.com from 7 to 9 Eastern. That is, oh, math, 4 to 6 Pacific. Then we have a rebroadcast on the Voluntary Virtues Network syndicated on Thursdays from 4 to 6 Eastern, which means that you can catch us at 1, 2, 3 Pacific on Thursdays, and the Voluntary Virtues Network is at YouTube.com, so check it out. Now, if you want to join us tonight, you can call us at 347-324-3704, or you can join us in the chat room at Freedomizer.com. We welcome comments, questions, remarks, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but we have a lot to talk about tonight. What are and we talking Mandy, about tonight? don't forget that they can always catch up whenever they want to because the shows are archived too. So if they can't make it live and want to listen to it when it's convenient for them, there's always that option. Fantastic. Thank you for throwing that in there. That's absolutely right. So glad you threw that in there. I don't even watch my TV shows on a schedule. Wow. Nope. That's what TiVos are for. Yeah, or, or torrents. One or two. Or torn. Well, we we talked about that last week. And maybe so what do you want to start with this we, week? I would say maybe this week when we go into a commercial break, I won't drown you out with Russian music. Oh, that would be nice. <laughs> yeah, and that's only for the that. Pravda update. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, that won't happen this week. Well, we got a lot of stuff to talk about this week, and we had some topics we were real passionate about. Um, There's a lot going on right now in the economy. We can kick off with that. Let's talk about that. Um, One of your favorite that you are a connoisseur of is raising prices, and I kind of am laughing at this because they're already really expensive, so you know exactly what I'm talking about, so why don't you talk about it? Okay, now which story? Is this the one about Starbucks? Yes, Starbucks to raise well, prices I mean, on drinks. The bag Starbucks coffee. is going up, but so so is everybody else. I mean, I'm always, I'm always shocked whenever the, these government clowns get on TV and they talk about how, don't worry, citizen, there's no real inflation out there. There's actually deflation. And all this other kind of stuff. And I'm always like, do these people grocery shop? You know, do they go down to their local little supermarket and pick stuff off the shelf and look at it and go, wow, that's kind of expensive compared to what it used to be? I guess these people don't do it. But anyway, Starbucks is going up on, on their drinks. Um, there was also a story um, last week or week before that meats are, of course, going up, and there's a lot of others. And they're blaming the weather, and they're blaming all sorts of other things. But they'll never admit that the government just prints too much money. So there you go. There, there's, the, there's the inflation update. The government well, prints too much money, and they don't admit it. Here's my concern, though. I, I used to work at Starbucks, and we've talked about this before. I used to help manage a Starbucks. When I was a manager, prices were going up 10 to 15 cents um, on coffee. You know, they did some, some price haggling, and there were some beverages that they offered for cheaper, like they were selling short cups of coffee for a dollar, and people can get that on a daily basis. But the truth of the matter is their drinks are already super expensive, and people will do this because Starbucks is like crack. But here's the connection I'm wondering. 
they just made an announcement, what was it, last week, that they're going to start giving scholarships to their college students. Is that, Who Starbucks is? Yes. Starbucks is going to start giving scholarships wow. to their partners. They don't call them employees. They call them partners because everybody has the option of owning stock. So they call them partners instead of uh, employees. That's what you'll never hear Starbucks call them employees. But here's I would call the them thing. baristas, but that's also appropriate because they make your coffee. Absolutely. Um, but see, here is my question: Did they announce that they were giving out scholarships first to justify a cost raise? Is the cost raise going towards the idea of giving them all scholarships, or were they just trying to take the focus off of the fact? that they were about to raise prices. That's really what I'm wondering. Well, I mean, who knows? I mean, probably it had something to do with it. My my guess is that um, most of these companies, you know, anytime you announce that you're going to raise prices, people don't like that. People don't like it when you say, hey, I'm going to go up on something. So, yeah, it's, it's always better, I guess, to mix some good news with the bad. You know, oh, but by the way, we're going to send some kids to college. This is great. You know, don't worry about it. So, I mean, sure, you know, all, all these companies, they kind of inadvertently help out the federal government because a lot of times what companies will do because they don't want to go up on their price, even though their inputs are going up because of inflation. What they'll do then is they'll reduce the quantity or the quality instead of raising price. And so it kind of camouf like. Like the, the whole thing of inflation and actually it affecting the, 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 the price is actually camouflaged in a lot of ways because in a lot of ways we don't see inflation. It's hidden from us because companies will do what I just talked about. They'll reduce the quality or the quantity. So when you go to get, say, orange juice at the grocery store, what the, the old orange juice cartons used to be like, I don't know, 20-something ounces, and now it's like 22 or something. Anyways, I don't remember what it was, but it, the, the cartons used to be bigger. Well, nobody wants to be the you know the guy to go up on the price, so they just reduce the quantity. And so this is going on all over the economy. And of course, companies like this are going to try to sugarcoat it and you know put on their best face. I mean, let's face it. What else are they going to do? So you know, I think that I recognize what you're talking about, um, especially with ice cream. You know how you could you you used to be able to buy uh, a quart of ice cream, and it was probably about like three bucks now you have to pay five dollars and you get a pint and something ounces of ice cream do you know what i'm talking about well yeah when i was a kid you used to get a half gallon well now if you go to the store it's not that the box is the same size except it's it's skinnier it's not as wide as it used to be and so i don't think it's quite a half gallon anymore when i was growing up it was half it's gallon ice cream that's what you went to the store and get you're right it is a half gallon that's what, and that's exactly what i was trying to say that illustrates the point perfectly with what you're talking about with the orange juice and everything is so expensive right now but you you had said that it's insane for the federal reserve to be printing out all this money and still are there was zero economic growth last quarter well yeah there was another story and i'm trying to remember where this one was let me see if i can find it uh i was on breitbart.com but anyway so just the story is this the fed just pumped in Two trillion dollars in stimulus, and you know what we got out of it? Nothing. We got less than 0.1 percent growth. We actually, the the economy contracted. And what's really interesting to me about this story is that the government is actually admitting the economy is contracting. The economy has been contracting for quite a few years now, but the way they doctor the CPI numbers, the the way they doctor all these different numbers, they add back in government spending. As part of the GDP. So what you end up with is a false picture. It makes the economy look better than what it really is. And so if they're actually now admitting that the economy, even according to their doctor numbers, is shrinking, and even after spending $2 trillion, that's not good. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that. It's bad. So – or I, excuse me. They, they claim 0.1% growth in, in some of the, the estimates. But – so that's point one percent. You just spent that's two nothing. trillion. Right. It's it's still contracting. I and I'm, I apologize. I was mistaken. I thought it was negative, uh, zero point one, uh, which they're never going to uh, admit to. It's contracting. I was shocked when I read that. I was like, oh, they're actually admitting it's contracting. No, they're still not admitting that the, the economy is contracting. But it is contracting. 
And if you go and you take out some of the bogus numbers and you you look at some uh, some of the stuff that's on like Shadow Stats that's run by the economist John Williams, where he goes through the CPI and the GDP numbers and he puts them together as the government used to put them together, you know, 30 years ago. Well, ever since uh, the, it was either the late 80s or early 90s, they changed the way in which they collect the statistics and they produce the reports. And so he does it the old way. And the reason they supposedly did it was because it was supposedly inaccurate the other way. But the other way showed a much bleaker picture, and of course they didn't like that. So, Well, you know, though, with all of the lying and deceiving that's going on in the economy, people are starting to notice this. People are starting to get very upset with the fact that we're being lied to, that laws are being changed to without our, our acknowledgement, maybe with our acknowledgement, and things look bad. I mean, but like I said, people are starting to fight back, and I think you and I ran across a few articles this week about how the federal government's even starting to fight back. I mean, we got Supreme Court bans, warrantless cell phone searches. They're um, talking about how certain things are unlawful. Uh, talking about the no fly list, we can let's talk about a few of these. In fact, let's talk about a few articles now. We, uh, yeah, actually, have, both of those shocked me. And me too, me too, honestly, because I'm looking at this going, huh? You know, and it wasn't just one event; it was more than one event, which it amazes me because it looks like that as upset as America is with the federal government. They're starting to do some things here that are making our eyebrows raise a little bit, saying, wait, this goes against what the president was trying to set up. So what exactly is going on here? So this article, I'm flying out of state next month. So this article was particularly of interest to me about the no-fly list violating the Constitution. Uh, a federal judge said this. So you posted this. Tell us a little bit about what you read in this article. Okay, now which one were we talking about? The uh, judge rules uh, no fly list violates Constitution? Yes. Okay, that's where you. You know, I, just as a whole, to back up a little bit, this and the cell phone um, decision, the Supreme Court bans warless, uh, warrantless cell phone searches. It's really interesting. Judge Roberts, the one who basically. It was he was the deciding vote that backed Obamacare. He's the one who said it was constitutional, though it was a very very controversial decision that the, the court was split. And the warrantless cell phone searches, if I'm not mistaken, it was unanimous. And it kind of makes me suspect. You've got all these different rulings, and all of a sudden, the Supreme Court seems to be on our side, which is really bizarre. As of late, it seems like every time the federal courts decide something, it's in favor of the federal government. So I'm going to say I'm very suspect about this, but hell, even idiots get things right sometimes, so I guess we should, well, you know, we should be happy about it. Um, and, and then the other, the federal judge rules on the, the, the no-fly list violates the Constitution. This just blew me away. I mean I had no idea this was coming. Um, now, whether or not this is – and from what I'm looking at in the article – it sounds like it was just one judge and a lower court, and maybe it, it, it'll go to the Supreme Court. Um, from what I'm seeing here, the U.S. District Judge Anna Brown ruling on a lawsuit filed in federal court in Oregon by 13 Muslim Americans who were branded with no-fly status ordered the government to come up with new procedures that allow people on the no-fly list to challenge that designation. So it is a win for us, but now that one – wasn't taken up by the Supreme Court, so we don't know how that's going to end up. It could end up going to the Supreme Court, and then at that point we'll have to see what these you know, men in dresses decide that all the rest of us should do. I, You know, it's like you said. We probably should be happy about this, but you know, there have been other lesser courts to also make some very radical decisions in opposition to what's going on in the government right now. You did mention it's a U.S. district judge, not saying that she's, she's any, in any small position, but like you stated, the fact that she is a U.S. district judge, if this even made it to the Supreme Court, I would, I would bet you anything that in the Supreme Court this would be overturned and the no-fly list would stand because they're in the back pocket of the POTUS, and they are not going to follow the country's constitution anymore. They're going to follow whatever the president tells them to do. 
because that well, you know right what, now Amanda? is the American way. I, I wonder, what do you think about this? Do you think maybe this has something to do with that uh, that poll that was just released recently by um, Gallup? It, it could be. Do you know which one um, I'm talking about? Yeah, you had mentioned a poll earlier this week that you were, I think you, you were just about jumping up and down going, holy cow, because, yeah, things um, – Things are not good right now for the government and people's faith in the government. Not that we should have faith in our government. The only people we should have faith in are ourselves, that we can run our own lives and take care of our own business. But those who still believe in the government, they are well, quickly losing faith. Well, you know, it is uh, – it's actually the list it almost reads like a top ten. I mean it is mind-blowing, the stuff that's on this list. I mean th- when I read this list, I was like – so many people obviously are starting to get it. Like I, I read on social media every day people that make comments that ten years ago they wouldn't have made. People wouldn't have made. Like people are really, I think, I think more people get it than what we as libertarians or anarchists or whatever that persuasion really know. I think they've got us somewhat convinced that we're the weirdos and that nobody thinks like we do. I remember when I'd finally come to, I mean, I was full blown. Libertarian as you can get. I was a minarchist. The only thing I thought the government should do is maybe, and I even question this, police, courts, and a military, and that was it. That was basically what I'd come to. No drug laws, nothing. I'd converted from being a Republican, and I remember I started studying Austrian economics, and I remember thinking this was you know 10 years ago. I remember thinking, man, there's nobody – like I'm like this – a crazy guy. I'm the only one who believes this stuff. Me and a few other people, you know, that I've read books by, and um, that I agree with, and that are of the similar persuasion. But then in 2008, I got involved in the Ron Paul campaign. Now I didn't actually work in the campaign at the time. I just got to know some people there, and all of a sudden, I'm finding people that think just like I do, or in, in a similar vein. So I think some of this we've got to be careful not to think. We're not a minority position anymore, not even close. The media wants to paint us as a minority position, and the establishment wants to paint us as a minority position, but we're not. And if, if you want to, we'll go ahead and get into the poll because the poll makes me I – mean, it's freaking amazing. It's awesome. Or do we want to wait a little while? No, we can get into this. I wanted to touch upon a point that you just made. You and I were talking even earlier today that um, – we were talking about how there's even infighting among the establishment. You and I had a lengthy discussion about Rand Paul and how we both said that he's a poser, he's a traitor, that a lot of people are saying, oh, no, no, he's just playing the game. But you and I agreed he's playing it a little too much to our liking. And Alan West was making Well, I wouldn't say he's week. a poser or a traitor. I wouldn't use that strong language. I don't know what he is. That's the problem I've got with him. He may be playing the game, but how do I know that? I mean, I can't tell. I don't have any way to tell that, you know? Absolutely. Well, those are the words that I used, and I'm not sure either. I just – I know that he can't be trusted. People are like, oh, he's just playing the game. He's as good as his dad. But who's to say that when he made it into the White House, if he did, that he would be – keeping his promises to the Liberty folk, you know, and the establishment, they're not buying his act. I know that he's trying to fit in, but they're not buying his act. And now there's just a bunch of infighting among them. Alan West called him a simpleton. And not that I am placing any <laughs> Well, you know, I kind of enjoyed the, the back and forth between him and um, – who's the, the fat governor of New Jersey? Chris Christie. He looks like Jabba the Hutt. Christie? <laughs> yes, Chris Christie, Chris Jabba Christie. the Hutt, who runs – I mean, he might as well be Jabba the Hutt. He's a gangster, and he looks like a giant worm. So he fits Jabba the Hutt's description <laughs> perfectly. I mean, he is. He runs the, the the state like a gangster. He looks like a gangster. So you know, I, but I really enjoyed the back and forth between Christie and Paul because Paul's not even nearly as hardcore as we are. And but even Paul, as imperfect as he is, it one one thing I really enjoy about Rand is. He exposes people on the right who are quote unquote conservative small government types. He exposes them as complete hypocrites. A complete hypocrite. And, and his dad did the same thing. I remember when um um oh gee, what was his name uh the the Christian guy who ran in 2012 Rick Rick uh, Santorum. Uh. I remember Santorum went on a rant in Fox News about how you know you know 
people of, of Ron Paul's persuasion want the government to stay out of their bedroom and stay out of their pocketbook and keep their taxes low, and they want a heavily individualistic society. But you know, no society that he knows of has ever existed that's, that's that way. And I was sitting there thinking, hmm, people that want the government out of their bedroom, out of their lives, and are extremely individualistic, and no society has ever existed like that. I remember Judge Napolitano's reaction was, has he ever heard of the United States of America? He just described us in the first hundred years of our country. Extremely limited government. The government stayed out of nearly everything, and it was in a, a very individualistic society. So I, I, that's one thing I like about Rand. I think he exposes these these worms, these snakes, for what they really are. They're lying hypocrites. We, we'll go back to the to the poll in a minute, but in addition to what you just said, I ran across um, a blurb this week from Policy Mike about how Ron Paul should run in 2016 because even at 77, he's still the only candidate who will save Republicans. I have no interest Amen. in saving the Republican Party. Okay, I have no interest in saving the Republican Party, but I think that he's the only person who's going to save every single person. I don't care if you're Democrat. I don't care if you're Republican. He's the only candidate that's going to work, period, if we have to have a candidate. But you said well, I, today I, even he made an interesting comment. What did Ron Paul say? Uh, well, he in a recent blog or uh, an op-ed or something, I can't remember where I saw it, but he basically said that he doesn't believe there is a political solution to the current problems. Now, he supports people in politics if that, that's where they think their energy should go, and he's going to support them. But at the end of the day, he doesn't believe there's a political solution. But I will say this about Ron Paul. I don't care if Ron is in a freaking wheelchair, he's peeing in a bag, and he can't talk. <laughs> He can only write notes. He would be a better president than the last 50 jerks we've had in there. I'm just saying. I think, I think and I would pickle, still vote for him. I think a pickle would make a better president than the oh, last yeah. 44 jerks we've had. If, if Ron Paul lost half of his brain capacity, he would still be better than anybody else we've got out there. What's really funny is that the, the writer of this blurb said that at the age of 90 or 100 or 110 or whatever age Ron Paul is, the man is healthier by all measures than Gingrich, Christie, or even Obama. <laughs> <laughs> he, he is. I remember the uh, South Carolina debate when um, they, they were talking about health issues or something came up, and Ron, Ron was like, oh, yeah, I bike X mile, like eight miles a day or ten miles a day or something like that, you know? And he's yeah you know, he was older than all of them. And he actually I can't remember if he invited Rick Perry or Newt Gingrich to come biking with him as kind of a joke to poke fun at him. I think it was Newt, but uh, he was on the Piers stuff. Morgan show, and Piers Morgan had said, "Why don't you just do the right thing and drop out of the race?" He goes, "And why don't you do the right thing and stop being silly?" <laughs> oh, did he did he tell that to Ron? Yes, he did. Yes, oh my God! Did. I miss. I've never seen Pierce Morgan interview Ron Paul. I'm gonna have to pull that up on you. I'm gonna have to YouTube that because I want to see you that. Are That'll have be to funny. Find it. Yeah, absolutely. That, Maybe you can find it during funny. the break even. But yeah, I mean, he's the only he's the only viable answer. And one of my friends said this week, "Oh, well, according to the Anarchy Views, um, and he's a he's a statist." Now, like you, you and I addressed last week that technically, yes, in that case, he would be a statist because he wants any form of government. But the comment you said he made today about no, no hope for the political side of things, that he's more on the side of the voluntarist or anarchist than maybe we once thought. Uh, well, no, I happen to believe that about a lot of people who are of the same persuasion we are. That they're minarchists for practical reasons. I mean, I, I would even – I've even called myself in past a minarchist or a classical liberal um, just for pr practical reasons. Now, I don't support a forced tax under my sort of classical liberalism. You would have m mainly small communities that would run their own affairs. They would have a small voluntary tax, and they would determine you know, how that's collected and how they do that. Provided it's voluntary, I don't really care. Um, and then they would provide those services based on that. And, I don't have a problem with some communities who said, you know, we're not going to we're not going to have a, a police force hire your own private security. Some neighborhoods would have to hire their own security. It would be better and cheaper. And with the technology we got today, I think it would be um, overall a much superior uh, system to what we have. But, you know, I'd, I'd leave that to people. But, you know, there there are people, I think, that become libert or become anarchists and they say, well, everybody else is evil if they believe in any kind of state. But even under anarchism, 
you could still have authority. You could have city states where people voluntarily join because you have the right of voluntary association under an anarchist system, and you would have some sort of city state where there's limited laws that everybody agrees upon, and if they don't like it, they leave and they go somewhere else. You know, and I would actually prefer a system like that. I would like to see something more like the old European um, system, which was just these city states. Um, I think people would in their natural lives be happier and you you know we talked about this earlier but you've kind of become more and more anarchist and for some people it's not that there's you know it's just boom it hits you and you're all of a sudden an anarchist. some people it just takes you time to transition into wrapping your brain around anarchy because if you've grown up all your life thinking of government well then thinking of no government scares the living hell out of you and believe me, they've made it that way because if anybody dares talk about there's no government, oh, my God, there'll be anarchy. People will shoot each other. You know, of course, it's all no, this, this propaganda. No. Not, no, not I mean, no, you've never had anyone react that way? Oh, no, no, I have. I'm just saying I'm disagreeing strongly with them because I'll tell you, I started out back in 2012. The first awakening I had to any political movement or political leanings was – uh, Ron Paul's grassroots movement here in the state of Georgia, and I used them as a guide. They were a very good guide. Uh, we had one of our state coordinators, um, Professor Bill Green. He works for the University of Texas, I think, or a university in Texas. He's a brilliant man, and he was the one saying, "Everybody become a delegate. Everybody become a delegate. They can't, you know, they can't deny the delegate numbers." And of course, we saw what happened, but. Ultimately, if they had worked the system the way they had created it, he's right. They couldn't have denied the delegates. But after that, you know, we're still involved in this movement. We're deciding where do we go now? What do we do now? They say, oh, hey, we need to save the Republican Party. So everybody go, get involved, become members of the Republican Party, take it over, take it back. And so that's what we did. I became secretary of the local party in my county, and I am on the executive board for my congressional district for the state. Here I am in these positions. Okay, what happens next? Okay, so we have some people who ran as a liberty candidate who made it actually into the state house. What happened? They all lost their positions this election because if there's anything that the establishment hates more, it's to lose spots to liberty people. They're going to make sure that they get their spots back. So that's what they did. So what do we do now? I don't know, but I worked for the campaign of somebody who was running for the Senate, that uh, for um, the U.S. Senate representing the state of Georgia after Saxby Shambliss retires, and my guy didn't make it into the top two for the runoff. And so I was just like, well, what do we do now? And all I realized and recognized throughout this whole process is that they don't care about values, they don't care about principles, they don't care about anything except just as long as the Republican wins, we beat the Democrats, the end. That's not good enough for me. And I'm sick of people making decisions. Now I was faced with the decision of voting, falsely voting for one of two people to represent the Republicans when neither one of them are any good, and I couldn't stand behind them because they don't represent my ideals. So I'm sitting here looking at this going, who are you going to vote for? Because neither one of them are viable for you. What are you going to do? And I said, to heck with it. I don't agree with any of this. The government, they don't care. There's no candidate that's going to represent every single person. We need to take care of ourselves. That's pretty much what drove me to the decision. I can't deal with this anymore. It's just tyranny. They're trying to take over everything. And when everything really hits the fan in the last moment, the only thing that's going to matter is martial law and the evil president that we have, period. Well, you know, I mean, I don't know how bad it's going to get, but I kind of think they've, I mean, pretty much taken over everything. I mean, geez, how much farther they can, can they go? Because right now, at least they, there's, enough of the free market left where when anything goes wrong they can go oh well, you know it's capitalism it's always it's so funny to me every time something goes wrong with the economy or with the country in general it's we didn't spend enough money the government wasn't big enough blah 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 i mean it's you know i think the problem i had too a couple of years ago was i no longer believe in democracy and it's not that i don't believe people should have a say in their government if you're going to have a government and that's a whole nother discussion but my problem is <laughs> It's it's mob rule, and that's basically what it's become. If you get a majority of your neighbors together, then they can force the minority of your neighbors to do whatever they want them to do and call it legal and legitimate by passing a law. So I don't even agree with democracy anymore. 
But yet that's the only tool which we have left to fight now, a tool which is completely illegitimate. So uh, there, I don't know. It's, there are I don't think it's going to get any better, though. Me. I don't think it's going to get better either. I think the only way that things are going to happen is if everything is burnt down to the ground and we rebuild. There are a few parts of me still mourning the loss, I guess you will, of the fact that everything that I've learned growing up, and especially as a teacher, this is very difficult. I felt the same way when I learned about how evil and nasty of a man Abraham Lincoln was. But uh, there's there's a little... I'm still transitioning, still mourning a little bit the fact that everything I taught was a sh- or learned and have been teaching is a sham. You know, they they pumped me full of ideas and facts that they called facts that are not. So this is this is really hard for me, but it makes a lot more sense um, this poll that you posted um, on why people are not in agreement with the government, they're really losing faith. So let's talk about this poll that you posted. And I think what what is amazing to me is that you start out with this really high number of 74% and you get down to 7%. And at the very top is the military. I don't know if we should have a great deal of faith in the military only because they're doing their job that they signed up for in the Middle East. But ultimately, we know that all the wars going on around the world are shams and they are just greedy money making schemes and killing off people. So but, but you, you know, about? Amanda, I actually think the military is shocking that it's that low, and this is why. Think about from the time you're a small child, you're taught certain reference for the military. You go to parades where they have military men and they wave the flag. Turn on the T V and everybody's talking about honoring the soldiers and This is over and over and over an entire life cycle. You are just bombarded with pro-military propaganda. I mean, in my lifetime, I was never exposed to any sort of even controversial thoughts like what the Anti-Federalists had, which said we don't need a a big military. Military is actually a standing army is a threat to liberty. That I was shocked, and these were well-respected men who. I've heard quoted before by quote unquote conservative people, but I surely never heard that part quoted. And so to me, I'm shocked that you've even got 26% of the people out there who don't have any faith in the military. I think that's shocking that um, things must be changing to, you know, to kind of, to be able to resist that sort of programming. I guess so. So I guess in that aspect, 74% is low for the military. I think some of these people who feel that they have a great deal of confidence in the military, I think some of them are are saying, well, everything that they're fighting for is a sham, but I still am not ready to believe that the military is not doing something right. I think some of those people are still on the fence. Oh yeah, I think well some of them I don't know if they I'd even go as far as saying they know it's a sham. There are people I believe in this world who know some of this stuff in their heart is a sham, but they don't want to admit it to themselves. I've met people like that who get so angry with me and it's because they don't want to admit it. I think the military is a big issue. I'm surprised that isn't ninety or ninety five percent. But it also shows us that the anti war libertarians aren't as you know there isn't as, as much of a small number of us as they think there is, and so there's a great deal more people than we think. I mean that to me is encouraging. I mean it, how, how much would it take to get to 50 percent? We don't need a lot more, and we could have half the people not even trusting it. The next one was not surprising to me, but small business. I mean most people have fondness in their heart for small business. They've been taught to all their life, and you know I, I don't think there's anything wrong with small business. I, I, I like small business, you know. The next one was um, police. And, you know what, though? What? I'm sorry, go going ahead. Back, going back to the small business, that makes me sad that only 62% had – there was only 62% who believed that they had a great deal and quite a lot of confidence in small business. And that makes me sad because that goes to show that the big companies, you know, the Walmarts and the big chains, they are keeping the smaller businesses from being able to compete. And – you know, often small businesses, people don't shop there because they get better deals because they can buy in bulk or they can buy cheaply at these big chain stores. 
so the fact they only had 62% of confidence, that, that is low as far as I'm concerned, and it's sad. It's sad to me. That number well, could don't, be high. Don't worry. We're going to get to big business, and there's not a whole lot of faith in big business. It's way down the list. Um, well, what's next the, on the, the next list? One is, said, well, it's the police, and this is what's so yeah. shocking. Can you believe it's only – it's 53 percent? Half the country doesn't trust the police. Well, can you – I mean, do you really blame them? What's been going around? I don't know about your Facebook feed, but mine's full of cops killing pets at home and going and intruding into people's homes without permission. And there was that child in Habersham County here in Georgia that had a, a, a grenade thrown at his face, and his face or was grenade or bomb or something. And it went off. A flashbang probably. They face. use flashbangs. Yeah, there you well, go. Well, you That's know, remember when New York um, – uh, New York um, uh, Police Department put up a, a thing on Twitter. Oh, hey, tweet back picture, photos of us, um, uh, of your you with your favorite police officer or something like that. And they were barraged with photos of police brutality, <laughs> of, of New York oh, City cops right. beating I'm people down. That. And that's not what they and, you know, And then there's Absolutely. YouTube videos all over the place. I mean I, I'm not shocked. I'm actually – this encourages me because this says – that people are no longer being fooled because they don't have a great deal or quite a lot of confidence in the police. Only 53%, barely over half, have have confidence in the police. So I, I, wonder how many, good... I wonder how many of that 53% are Democrats. Well, yeah, I, this is supposedly nonpartisan polls, so you're getting a mixture of Democrats, Libertarians, Independents, Republicans. I would imagine that you're getting a – a pretty good sampling. Um, you know, the next one was church or organized religion at 45%. Uh, the only thing I would say about this, and not to offend anybody who's Catholic, but I think a lot of what the Pope's doing now, I think that's kind of causing some concern within his faith, and also uh, people are observing it from the outside. I mean, do you get that feeling? I read an article this past week that the Pope excommunicated the Italian mafia. Okay, you know, and I had to laugh. That because that that's a high-ranking group of people in Italy, and not high-ranking because they're amazing, but high-ranking from fear because they're very powerful. <laughs> they kill um, people. <laughs> so, so I'm really thinking. I'm sitting here thinking, oh wow. Okay, so the current pope is excommunicating the Italian mafia, who basically the article summed up that they only come to church to save faith and make themselves look good anyway. But that pope. That's pretty. That's pretty radical for the head of the Catholic Church to sit there and say, "Yeah, I just excommunicated you. Don't show up to my church. You're not a member." So I don't know what he's doing, but it's like you said, the Catholic Church. <clears throat> there's a lot of decisions being made by the Pope lately. That's, I think, raising the eyes and eyebrows of several Catholics. So, I, yeah, I some of the conservative Catholics are having problems with him. He's making a lot of left wing statements. Um, and I'm just I wonder if that has something to do with it. But you know, I mean, I think some distrust in, in organized religion is probably a good thing. And it might be all I know all. that um speaking from my personal point of view, I I just see a lot of corruption in the church that would drive people away if they really understood what was going on. I mean, let's take a look at for instance, let's take a look at Joel Osteen. He has a mega church, where is it now? Out in Texas. He took over an old sports stadium and turned it into a church. That goes beyond what a church should be. I can't – and he's raking in millions of dollars every single year. He's, he's living off of wealth. And I'm not saying that wealthy people can't exist. I'm not saying that at all. But when you're in the business of teaching humility, I don't think you're setting a good example. I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently so. You're supposed to go buy an old sports arena or stadium and create your own mega church. That's your calling, John Moreland, bet, Pastor Moreland. Yeah, I know. If if I was more religious, I bet I'd be a good preacher. I, I'd hammer. I, it, yeah, they like it when when preachers get loud and boisterous. So I'd fit. I'd, I'd do really well. Pass around that offering plate. Come on, people. <laughs> The next one on this list does not surprise me. The medical system. No, wait a minute. This one should, should shock you. 
I thought they fixed everything. I thought that men wrote down stuff on a piece of paper, and magically everything was, was fixed. I am shocked at this one. Well, I think the the reason that this one is so low is because, um, I don't know, I guess they're lumping in, I'm hoping they're lumping in pharmaceuticals, the pharmaceutical company. Well, well tell the folks system. which one we're talking about. Uh, well, there's two on the list. I'm really confused. One is the healthcare system and one is the medical system. So, And they're not saying which is which. All I know is that the medical system is at 34% and the healthcare system is at 23%. Both of those are dismal numbers. Dismal. Yeah, dismal. Which, but I thought everything was fixed. It is. Obamacare fixed We passed the law. We, well, Amanda, I don't get it. We passed the law. We had men in ties write down something on a piece of paper, and that, may, that that's all it takes. Everything's fixed it once, you, once you do that. It was it magical is, paper. It's supposed to be magic. I'm very upset with the Obama administration right now. I thought all this was taken care of. Well, my faith in the medical system is broken. <laughs> it's, it's well, totally you know, we were talking broken. about the Supreme Court earlier. About all these th this weird decision just coming out of nowhere. Well, maybe they saw this poll and was like, "We got to give these people something." Thirty percent. That means seventy percent of the people have no confidence in the Supreme Court, and for good reason. I mean, these are men in dresses who put themselves up as gods. These are supposed to be legal scholars, right? But if you go through most of their decisions, they're five four. Well, if it's purely just legal and not a political question. Why aren't these skewed more heavily one way or the other? Why isn't it – why don't we have more unanimous decisions? You know, Why do we have all these 5-4 decisions? Why not 8-1 or 7-2? That would make a lot more sense. Well, as we, learned in, as we learned in political science in college, I actually had a really good political science teacher for once, and he said – that the U.S. Supreme Court is supposed to be nonpartisan. But the fact of the matter is that if you're a president, you have three open spots and you are supposed to appoint people to fill those spots. You are, of course, you're going to appoint people who think the way that you do so that your agenda can be filled in the Supreme Court. As we're seeing, though, it doesn't matter who appointed who these days, we're having decisions crazy radical decisions made by the parts of the Supreme Court that we thought we could, quote, unquote, trust. You know, like, for instance, oh, Obamacare was passed, you know, and the head of the Supreme Court, he voted, yes, that it's constitutional when we all know it wasn't. Well, yeah, and it's not like it was – I mean, and these people, after it, it supposedly was deemed constitutional – by the, the, the men in dresses, um, they they ran around and acted like, see, we told you so. And I'm sitting there thinking, you had a 5-4 decision. But you run around and act like this was a slam dunk, like all nine members looked at it and said, a flat on his face. Oh, yeah, that's constitutional. <laughs> I mean, come yeah, on. Really not. Any idiot like that reads the Constitution go, I don't see health care in there. You know, Article 1, Section 8. I don't see any health care. I'm sorry. Well, the next one we'll talk about, and then after, the, after this we'll go to a break. But the next one on the list was the presidency with only 29%. I'm surprised it's that high. <laughs> uh, you know, I am too, especially the last two boobs we've had in there. I mean, let's face it. I mean, Clinton was kind of just – Clinton was an idiot, but you kind of knew what you were getting. I don't think people had these – High expectations that, you know, some scholar from Arkansas had arrived at the White House and was going to show us the way. <laughs> Nobody thought that. Everybody knew he was this boo from Arkansas. But you know what? Then we got George Bush and we got uh, – or yeah, George Bush and uh, Barack Obama. How did that happen? I have no idea. But I'll tell you, before we go to a break, we do have a caller. I'm going to bring the caller in. Hello, Larry. Let's do How it. are you? Buenos noches, Senor Amanda. Good Howdy, evening. Howdy, John. How you doing, you little anarchist? You? Hey, as far pretty as good. Are you, in, are you in Mexico this week? No, Senor. <laughs> we no do Mexico. We stay away. Too dangerous. 
I know like gato burritos, okay? But anyway, hey, check this out, Holmes. All right, now the government, powers that be, changed midstream and decided to argue that the old blah, blah health care plan was a tax. So they can't back out of that argument now because they argued that in the Supreme Court. You with me so far? Correct. Yep. All right, good. Roberts didn't sell us out. He handed us something on a gold platter. He said, okay, fine. I'm paraphrasing. Do you want it to be a tax? Technically, constitutionally, it can be a tax. That's all he said. All right? Now, turn around. But you know when they sold it to everybody, they said it wasn't a tax. I just want to throw that in there. John, no. Hush. Where do the tax laws originate by Constitution? Well, no, I don't disagree they have the right to tax in the Constitution. No, no, John. Think about what I'm asking you. Where do tax laws originate in the Constitution? From the Congress. Gosh, you're dead. House of Representatives. Well, okay, the House of Representatives. Yes, it starts with the legislative branch. Okay. Well, they're both. Anyway, you need to go back to study the Constitution. Where did this bill start? Robert. Did it start in the Senate? I have no idea. See, you don't do your homework, son. That's exactly where it started. It's unconstitutional because of where it started, and Robert handed it to us on a gold platter. He said, yeah, okay, it's a tax. Now, a judge, it's not a judge's duty to tell us what to do. It's like a judge told me one time. It's not up to me to teach you how to protect yourself in court. Ignorance of the law is no excuse, son. Because I met him later at a friend of mine's house because he was related to a really good friend of mine, okay? And the judge that I went up into a courtroom against uh, happened to be Now, a now Larry, I don't uncle. necessarily disagree with what you're saying, but but my question is this. We we all have to admit that when they did sell it, they or they tried to sell it, the men in black hats came by and tried They said, oh, no, no, this isn't a tax. Then they went to the Supreme Court well, and said, no, oh, yeah, no, by the way, on. it is a tax. Really, exactly. Hold on now. At first, when they were saying, when when the blah, blah admin were saying, it's not a tax because they knew it wasn't legal to start a tax in the Senate. That's when the Supreme Court was against it. Then, because the old blah, blah people got suckered in, in a way, because they, uh, Robert said, oh, if it was a tax, it would be legitimate, okay? As far as you could, you have the power to tax the people, okay? You can't make them get a health care plan, but you can tax them, all right? That's all he said. Right. Then the blah, blah admin changed midstream and said, oh, okay, it's a tax. And Robert said, okay, fine, it's a tax. That's constitutional to tax the people. Now, Well, from what you're telling me, a whole other no, reason no, no. not to like the Constitution. <laughs> no, it's, no, it's exactly the reason why to like the Constitution. It's a reason why not to like the Sixth Amendment, which is not a constitutional amendment because it was never properly ratified. But that's another story. Robert yeah, but the a, problem you're going to have is John, how at this that's, point... Well, I'm asking a question. Uh, I can. Matters. It's my show. I can interrupt and ask a question. All right, Larry. Well, let so me I'm going to ask a question. No, no Hold not on. if you want to be a good host. You're being a terrible host. Okay. Robert well, let Canada's... me be a terrible host for a second. I know it, it's called a dialogue, Larry. When people talk, no. there's back and forth. It's not a monologue. It's a dialogue. So all I want to do is ask a question. Therefore, from what you're saying, how do you get rid of it then? Okay. John, you still there? I'm here. I think that I'm not sure if he hung up or if he's having a, a bad connection, but uh, he he has, uh, I guess he left. So anyway, on that okay. note, um, 
we will take a commercial break and we will we will be back after these messages. Hi, I have a question for you. Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Do you want a company that provides good quality ingredients and does not use artificial sweeteners? Look no further. Genesis Pure has a complete lineup of health and wellness, sports performance, and superfruit juices like noni and mangosteen that are pure, wild harvested with no binders and fillers. The philosophy is simple. Cleanse the body of toxins, balance the body's pH and hormones, and build the body nutritionally. Every race has a starting line, and yours is cleanse, balance, build. Sign up for at least a 25% discount and include auto ship of at least one product to start building up 20% back in points for free products. It's a win-win. Help fund our operation while you fund your body nutritionally. Start your journey at genesispure.com backslash freedomizer health. Again, that is genesispure.com backslash freedomizer health. This is Mercy. If you're listening to this message, warriors, you are the resistance. Warriors, you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. Read about it in the Sovereign, newspaper of the resistance. Available now at newsstands everywhere. The Sovereign is a monthly 24-page tabloid newspaper featuring incendiary content about life during wartime in the age of Obama. Warriors, keep to date every month. Remember to read The Sovereign, newspaper of the resistance. Available at newsstands everywhere. This alert is for all you boppers out there in the big city, all you street people with an ear for the action. This is Mercy. If you're listening to this message, Warriors, you are the resistance. This is Mercy. Mine will be the last voice you will ever hear. Don't be alarmed. Hello, Freedom Isers. This is Ron from Ron's Media Matrix. We've moved to a new time slot here on Freedom Isers Radio. Our show will now be broadcast every Friday from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. As always, we'll have an interesting lineup of guests, including independent musical artists, authors, speakers, and even some of the more controversial Internet celebrities. We'll also be covering groundbreaking news from the Internet, along with lots of lively dialogue from our callers. Remember, that's Ron's Media Matrix every Friday from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time right here on Freedom Miles Radio. Be sure to check us out at www.freedommilesradio.com or you can call in or listen by phone at 347-324-3704. Once again, that's 347-324-3704. Be sure to tune in. Hey, Freedom Us, join me, Proof Negative, weeknights, 9 p.m. to midnight Eastern, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Pacific, as we fight the new world order together, right here on Freedomizer Radio, your exclusive home of the Proof Negative show. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order. A world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of men. Over my dead body, join Podcast 13 every Sunday at 10.30 Eastern Standard Time, 7.30 Pacific, only on Freedomizer Radio. There is a new program on the Freedomizer Network. Bloody Beak Radio, punching the New World Order in the nose. Bloody Beak Radio is here to inform you on a wide variety of topics revolving around current and recent events. The main thrust of the show is not just to inform you of the problems we face, but rather, how do we analyze them in a way that we can use to create counter-propaganda and use that knowledge in our everyday lives? In a sense, how do we market the truth? 
Bloody Beak Radio will give you the tools to win the information war so we can destroy the barriers that divide the people and have a peaceful revolution. Join your host, Kyle Baker, on Sunday evenings to have an honest discussion about how to win the numbers game and ensure that we decide the tipping point, not them. Okay, and we're back after that little wonderful commercial break and the amazing debate we had going on before that. I think that we should go back to the list that we were talking about. We had left off with the presidency. What was next on the list? Uh, We should skip the next one, Amanda. We should, because we're just going to have a debate on the air, too. And you and I talked about the conflict. Actually, it's, it's public schools, and I have an inner conflict going on with public schools because I'm a public school teacher, but I go in and I try to teach children the truth. So I'm I'm fighting an inner conflict here. John thinks he has the solution to schools. We won't talk about that because we've talked about it before. And then I got upset because I had an inner conflict. And I'm sitting here saying, why am I defending it when I know it needs to be changed? Well, because I work for the system, but then I'm in there trying to change the system. So the only conclusion I came to is that I have multiple personalities when it comes to public schools. So we're going to go Well, just on. to clarify, my my solution is no solution. Everybody makes their own decisions, sends their kids to their own schools. I don't, I don't dictate what they do. That's my, my solution is stay out of it and let people make their own decisions. So just to clarify, I don't really have a solution. There you go. Okay, and the next one, again, I'm surprised that people have this much confidence, but uh, confidence in banks. 26% have a great deal of confidence in banks. But yeah, but you know, I mean, that means 74% don't. I mean, that's good. People don't trust the banks. This is a good good change. This is fantastic. It, that is a good change. I love it. That is. I could I agree with you on that. I guess I have to look at it the other way. I'm still just shocked that 26% You, you know what's that funny, though, Amanda? Thing. All this stuff is... These are major institutions we're talking about. I mean, if these institutions evaporated tomorrow, we, our society would be completely different. These are power structures, and I'm just blown away that people – I mean, very few people have confidence. I mean, that I, I was shocked at the poll that it, it came back with the numbers it did. So do you want to do the next one? Yeah, I'm still here. I was uh, responding to somebody I was talking to on Facebook who said that she trusts her bank, which is, I mean, it's fine. People are allowed to trust the <laughs> banks if they want. I trust my credit union. Uh, it's not as bad as a bank, but if there was an alternate thing, I would, I would choose uh, to do something different. She says that her bank is You nice. know what that reminds well, me of, Amanda? What? Do, do, do you remember the first Spider-Man movie with Tobey Maguire, the first one? Yes, I own it. Okay. I own it. Do you remember who walk, walks into – what's the name of the guy who runs the um, – he runs the newspaper, and he's got the really bad haircut? Oh, I don't remember. I used to read the comics when I was a kid. Okay, well, anyways, he walks into the newspaper editor's office, and he goes, you know what your problem is? You don't trust anyone. And he goes, I trust my barber. <laughs> and the guy's got, like, the worst <laughs> haircut ever. That's awesome. That's hilarious. That's what reminds That's me of when it's like, I trust my banks. <laughs> <laughs> the banks, the banks are into fractional reserve banking, and they borrowed printed money from the Fed. Can, I mean, this is like monopoly money that they play with. I mean, have you ever well, watched the bank to go? It, Sorry, yeah. we're out of loans. We're out of loans. They're turning into monopoly money happened. too. They're turning into monopoly well, money. Well, other countries and like banks do? have done that. Uh huh. Let's go on to the next one. That what that one makes me okay. mad. And we talked we talked about the healthcare system that is a hot mess. We talked about that earlier with the medical system. I'm not sure how to distinguish between the two, but we all know that pharmaceutical companies are just trying to make money. They don't ever get to the root of the problem that you're feeling because then you wouldn't need them anymore except here or there instead of continuous care. So they're just going to give you something to mask the symptoms the end. So I'm not sure how to distinguish between the medical system and the healthcare system. Um, the next, the healthcare system though was 23%, and the next 
category also ties with that, the criminal justice system at 23%. Yeah, which to me is kind of weird because the criminal justice system is 23%, and, and that's, of course, really low, which shows that people don't believe they're going to get justice in this country. But yet they still have 53% have confidence in the police. This is kind of bizarre. I mean, I'm trying to like figure that out. Like the same people who said the criminal justice system sucks, there had to be some crossover with some of the people who said, "Oh yeah, the police are doing a good job though." <laughs> well, here's, Isn't here's that my great? Next, the next one makes me really curious. The next one makes me really curious, and why they the way they did, I don't understand. We have newspapers. Um, on the list separated from television news and news on the Internet, which is fascinating to me because to me that would all fall under media. But people have more trust and confidence in newspapers at 22% than they do with news on the Internet and television news. So what do you think the difference is? Well, I mean, it's barely. I mean, you could even say that's probably margin of error. Newspapers is 22, television is at 19, and television, uh, excuse me, News on the internet is at 19, and television news is at 18. So, I mean, they're all right there hovering around 20%, which means about 80% of the country knows that the news is crap. <laughs> and it is. I mean, I have a background in media, and I recognize that we have more censorship in our media than China does. And China is a communist country. That's shameful. Well, you know, that Amanda, is really shameful. me and you are bringing back standards and news. We're we're bringing back the standards and media. That's what we do every Wednesday night. <laughs> you know, and the same person I was talking to about banks just brought up an amazing point. You no, know, she brought up a great point here. She said people know that they can lie on the internet and on the TV, but they don't know they can lie on print too. I think she brings up a good point. I think that if the media is a newer format, we're going to have a lot of people who used to rely on traditional media like newspapers who still rely on that old on the old ways and have less faith in the new ways. I think I think that <laughs> some of those people Maybe. probably feel that way. Probably. Well, but do you um, remember the guy who 10 years ago he was fired from the New York Times. He had worked for him for like, I don't know, 10, 15 years, and all of his stories he made up. Like he would write a story, and he would just make up a statistic and put it in there. Oh, Jason Do you remember this? somebody or the other. Jason somebody or the other yes. was that guy's I don't name. Know. I don't know if I buy that argument. I mean maybe, but I mean maybe there's a little bit better you know, kind of news people in, in newspapers than there is on the, med in, on the internet or in the, in television. But I don't know. I doubt that. I think Do most of them know? are liars and crooks. Who pick, Yeah, but after he left his job at that newspaper, who picked him up and hired him? Who? I don't. I have no idea. The Grudge Report. The Drudge Report picked him up? Yes. He went and worked for the Drudge Report after he got fired for plagiarism. Yes. He, plagiarism he went and worked for Matt Drudge. That's it, as I understand. Yes. All right, all right. Do we know this guy's yeah. name? I want to Google this. It's just, it's Jason somebody. We'll we'll look it up during our next break. We'll look it up during our next break okay. because we have still got a few other items on this list. Next is organized labor. Gee, that's a shocker. I guess that would um, include labor unions. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. It, it would. I, you know. I was actually. I was really happy about that number. I was like, good. People realize they're crooks. 78% 70 of the people realize organized labor, labor unions are a bunch of crooks. And here you here the next one you said, big business. We mentioned that earlier. They have a lot more faith in small business than they do in big business. I think mm -hmm. I think the sheer fact of that is the is that small business, you are dealing with a person face to face. You know who you're dealing with. You yep. know there's an actual person. With the big business, you don't know what you're de dealing with. You might be talking to somebody off in India who works in a call center that was hired specifically for the pur purpose of taking care of problems for one of those big chains across the nation. So I think that's why people have less faith in big, big business. Now, now, what we were talking about is also news on the Internet. There are so many 
small outlets out there on the Internet, I think, dispensing the quote-unquote real information that we're seeking. Um, I think a lot of people have problem with news on the Internet because, one, those small organizations might not be as quote-unquote credible as the larger outlets. But as you and I know and people who are awake, the larger outlets, are catering to a certain group of people. So it's like basically CNN versus um, Fox News, which would be, you know, Republicans versus Democrats. But they'll trust those over little sites because they know the big names. Yeah, you know, it's a mixed bag. I mean, a lot of times anymore, who knows what to believe anymore. Television news is next on the list with 18%. I don't even watch television. I don't watch the television news. I seek out my own news sources, so 18%. And then last on the list, I'm going to let you do this one because you got very excited about this. Last on the, the list big with winner, 7%. The big winner is the United States Congress at 7%. That means 93%. <laughs> 93% of the country have no faith in these jerks. It's about time. And every two years we get together and we vote for these jerks as if they're going to change our lives. I think people are figuring out that's not going to work. But now if we could only convince these people who have no trust or faith in Congress that that should also include the president. I don't think enough people – put the two and two together and realize, oh, it's part of the same package. Yeah, but still 71% not, you know, not trusting or not having confidence in the in the uh in the presidency. I mean, that's I mean, it's not as it's better than I thought it would be, but um it's definitely a good trend. You know, there's a lot of people, I think psychologically, who have a problem with with um coming to grips with the the reality that is versus what they've been told their entire life. And I think a lot of people are still holding on to hope. You know, it's kind of, well, I think I know. it's kind of like the same way a lot of businesses are holding on, thinking the economy is going to get better. It's not. I'm sorry. Well, I know a lot of a lot of people are having that inner conflict. I think I think a lot of people today are starting to understand and be a part of a different generation that is not learning to rely upon the government. They're learning that the government is not there to help us. I am really afraid for anybody who is brought up to believe this. I mean, my parents, my parents are getting more and more to the point that my mom, she's just sick of government altogether. I don't think she's finally embraced ruling yourself or taking control of your life, but she is tired of the government. She's tired of seeing the right left so called paradigm and her friends fighting on the on the internet about, oh, Republicans are better than Democrats. And I think it's it's kind of like letting go little by little. She has a friend who used to be a Republican. She converted to a Democrat to support Obama twice. And her friend will bash the Republicans and bash the Republicans and bash the Republicans. And my mom's like, why aren't you bashing the Democrats too? You know that it's corrupt. It's like her friend knows also. She has seen the things that are going on with the president, but she's unwilling to take that final step and let everything go. It's like me. Yeah, with you know, my that's views. pretty typical. Well, it's like me. You know, we're seeing the same public phrase. education. Well, you know, we're seeing the same crazy mentality we saw under Bush. No matter what Bush did, Bush even let um, Ted Kennedy of the left write the education bill. They didn't disown him for that. He spied on us. They didn't disown him for that. Um, he got us into this war under false pretenses. They w could not disown him for that. It's like the right had a real hard time with just admitting, hey, our guy screwed up. And you know, Democrats are doing the same thing with Obama now. They can't admit, hey, our guys made mistakes. It's it's almost like this team mentality. You know, no matter what your team does, you're going to support them. Yeah, and but that's what I said. You know, earlier, it doesn't matter what they stand for. It doesn't matter what the candidate stands for. People are still trying to ask me, well, who are you voting for in the runoff? Are you voting for Jack Kingston for the Senate? Or are you voting for uh, David Perdue? And I was like, I can't stand behind either one of them. They're cut from the same yeah, you know, cloth. I mean, I, I My buddy I had an it. idea. Run a candidate called Nobody so that you can actually check the box for Nobody. Well, you and I had the idea earlier today, too, that for those of us who don't believe in voting, 
go out and vote for the third party. Go out and do it. Yeah. You know, if it if it doesn't matter anyway, why not bolster the only hope that we have left for this country if we have to have an organized government of some kind? Make it as small as possible. I'm not saying I, I at this point want any government. Any government, small government, they have the ability to become too big for their britches, and we have seen this consistently over the last several centuries. So I, I'm just – if you need to go – and you and you don't think voting is worth it? At least go vote and give the underdogs some support. You know, you don't have to vote. Republican. Well, you know, you my thing is, at Democrat. least it would disrupt the system. You know, it's true. It's true. I mean, and there's so many different sc- once, uh, scenarios where it would be disrupted. What's that? Well, for for once, go out and vote your conscience. If your conscience is saying don't do Republican, don't vote Democrat, go out and do something for a system. That will actually help. Yeah, it might be out of your box. It might be radical, but do it. Go out and do it. If you feel like voting is something you have to do, but you don't like the candidates, just do something different. Because if your mentality is they're not going to win anyway, then what is? How did did you waste a vote? No, you went out and did your duty as a citizen, and you didn't have to vote for anybody you didn't believe in. Yeah, I mean, they always say, well, if you vote third party, or vote, you're wasting your vote. Well, if you're not going to vote at all, I say everybody who's not going to vote at all, vote third party. If enough of us who don't want to vote at all just voted third party, it would so disrupt the system on so many levels. I mean, not even – even if we hoped and dreamed that a bunch of third party people actually got in to the government, that would totally disrupt them because now – you know, they, these parties have figured out how to – it's a machine now. They figured out how to manipulate the system. These new folks, it would take them a while to, to get accustomed to how to manipulate the system. But even if they didn't win, if it just disrupted the voting enough to where parties started taking losses and they were taking losses because people were voting third party and it started disrupting the system and say 20 percent of the people started voting third party, it would scare the hell out of the two major parties. Well, that somebody and that would said be fun. If, it, if the third party, I think somebody from the Georgia Liberty Movement, I can't remember who it was, said if the libertarians across the nation, the libertarian party got 5% of the vote, they would start getting all kinds of funding, like $90 million worth of funding for their cause. And I know that we feverishly were trying to get people out to, to do that. They're saying, you know, if Ron Paul doesn't make it and he can't be the president, uh, then – Get get that up so they can have more funding. Well, the thing about Ron Paul, like we discussed on a previous episode of our show, was that he never intended to be the president. And I can't remember who it was. It was at the Ron Paul rally. The rally was like six hours long in Tampa in 2012. And whoever said it, it might have been Lou Rockwell who said it. Uh, one of them said he never intended to be president. He knew that the only way to get his message out was to run for president. So that left us with the only option of Mitt Romney or Barack Obama, which are the same people, or the third-party option. And, you know, I think they only got 1% out of that race, but like we've agreed, people are waking up, and people are starting to see what's going on. So if you are deadly opposed to voting, or at least you can't stomach voting for any of the candidates just because, just go out and vote third-party and give them a little boost. My liberty people to come along with me, but meetings, I told him, "Here's what I'm going to do: either you give us a liberty candidate and you gain our vote for the Republican Party, or you put up some slime ball like Mitt Romney, and I'll vote Democrat." So now my vote counts twice. I took a vote from you, and I voted for the opposition. And I thought that was great because that means basically we would have twice the effectiveness. Like from a number standpoint, because now we'd be actively voting and camp. They said that was too uh too extreme. I thought it was kind of fun too. I had a great time seeing the faces of the establishment Republicans when I told them this. It was a lot of fun. What did you it tell was. them? You broke up. You broke up a little bit there. What did you tell them that was a lot of fun? Okay, I told them. I said, look. I said, either you give us a liberty candidate, not a slime ball like uh, Mitt Romney. You give us a true liberty candidate like Ron Paul, or I'll vote Democrat. 
So not only will I not, you won't get my vote, you'll lose my vote, and I'll actively campaign and vote for the other side. Now my vote kind of counts twice. And so I tried to get all these Liberty people to do that with me. They, everybody thought it was too extreme. I thought it was a brilliant idea because if we're only 10% of the Republican Party, right, but we voted – we threatened them that we're going to vote Democrat, we could really hurt them. I mean really hurt them in an election, and that would give us you know, some sort – something. No, nobody liked well, that idea. Me, but I did enjoy I did enjoy looking at the faces of the establishment Republicans when I'd go to these Republican meetings when I told them that that was what I was going to do. That's hilarious. And earlier you were talking about how the Republican Party and the establishment are losing are quickly losing foothold, and that they're spending billions, millions, whatever amount of dollars to keep their place. In politics in in the U.S. and you know I just thought of something. I had uh, one of the people who was involved in the grassroots movement here in Georgia with me. He ran for the Georgia State House and he made it in. He recently lost his position because of the establishment trying to take him over. And I, when you talked about how much money they were putting into trying to hold their positions and hold power. Uh, he had people from the likes of Home Depot Corporation, Coca-Cola Corporation, putting up money to f- spread false information about him and get him out of his position. So, you know, people. Oh yeah, this is going on. The establishment is having to spend a lot of money to fight off these Tea Party and other candidates, Liberty candidates. And it's funny the news media never call them Liberty candidates. I always think that's interesting, but they're spending well, a you- lot of cash. Well, like I was saying, too, that um, the, t- one person said that it's amazing uh, – or well, it's, no, it's not amazing that, that he lost his spot because they are going to fight to keep those positions. But on the other hand, we could look at it as – look at the names of those corporations. You've got Home Depot, huge, huge corporation. You have Coca-Cola, a, a billion-dollar, trillion-dollar corporation that is worldwide. And if Liberty candidates and people from those organizations are having to spend that kind of money on Liberty candidates, we must be making um, ground. We must be taking foothold somewhere because those are huge names to have to be tackled tackled by. Well, I I mean, yeah, there was a race, I think, in New York where it was 49-51% and just barely the establishment guy hung on. I mean, just barely. Um, oh, here's a story. Actually, it's on Drudgeport. Now they're reporting that some 25,000 Democrat voters actually voted in their primary to help him win. Isn't that funny? His name is – what's his name? Thad Cochran? And who is Thad Cochran? He, he's a oh, – um, he's a Republican. He's Is he a House member or a senator? I'm not sure. I think he's a House member. Anyways – He's a um, he's a candidate that was running in the New York primary, and now there's talk that he got a lot of support from Democrats. They did put out a a flyer that said the Tea Party intends to prevent you from voting. If challenged, demand your right to vote. Don't let Tea Party representatives discourage you from voting in the Senate runoff Tuesday, June 24th. We need to vote Thad Cochran on Tuesday. Interesting. You know, there's a oh, Democrat I'm sorry. He's, who, he's from he's from Mississippi. There was another one from New York. I don't remember which one that was, but it was like it was pretty close. And the one in Mississippi Democratic, was really close too. There's a Democratic movement in the U.S. I don't know. Oh, I can't remember. I need to find out who the girl was, but she is a Democrat. She claims to be a Democrat, but there are Democrats that don't support President Obama. I can't remember who this lady is, but I was shocked to read all this. If I can find out who she is, then I will certainly let you know. You'll look up the clip about uh, Ron Paul from um, the Pierce and Morgan show, and I'll try to find this girl uh, when we have a chance. But um, going through the articles, you had another article paired up with the one that we just finished, the, the list of the least trusted organizations, that says that America's faith in media is at an all-time low. And it went along with the Gallup poll that we just read. Well, as I say, before we do that, I was actually incorrect earlier when I was talking about the economy shrinking. But 
I I must have been getting confused. I must have gotten confused with another another article because Drudge is reporting the GDP shrank by two negative two point nine percent. So the economy did actually shrink, and they're actually admitting to it. This is on CNBC. Throw that out there. Because <laughs> they don't hide anything good. anymore. They don't hide anything anymore. They're doing things in plain view because people are letting them get away with it. You know, our dollar is absolutely worthless. It, it's worthless. We're paying. We talked about this before. We, we're paying almost four dollars a gallon down here for gas, and it's not because that gas is getting more expensive. It's because the dollar is worthless. Yes, yeah, it's, it's worthless. Absolutely, and that's that's the big misconception. And even for shorthand, I'll say that prices are rising. Technically, that's not true. The 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 basically the purchasing power of the dollar you're using is worth less. So the dollar's worth less. So it takes more dollars to buy. X product. So that's what's actually happening. The dollar's losing value. So well, This article that I'm reading, this went along with the Gallup poll that we went over. It said 22% of respondents trust newspapers, 19% trust web-based news sites, and 18% say that they trust TV. All three of those numbers are within the poll's four-point margin of error. But listen to this. Faith in print media is down 29 points since it peaked in 1979. TV peaked in 1993 with a 46% confidence rating, and it says, oddly, Gallup hadn't asked a question about the Internet since 1999, but the difference from 21% then to 19% now is statistically negligible. So this is saying to me that these organizations, these outlets, people never really had a lot of faith in them to begin with. Yeah, you know, I, I think maybe it goes back to that um, that perception thing. Maybe we always perceive the world or, or people as approving of these things, and now that we've got the internet, we can see. If you go and look for the information, you can find out. Well, maybe all maybe you're right all along. They you know well, they never trusted them to begin with. It says another interesting takeaway from this survey, self-identified political conservatives trust in newspapers has tied its all-time low with 15%, while confidence among self-identified liberals, though still down over the last 10 years, is more than double of that of conservatives at 34%. I, I think this makes it look like it's directly tied to government and political beliefs. So the fact that it sent to me says that they, the conservatives believe that media is tied to the presidency, and we know that. Media is in his back pocket. They don't like the president. They don't like Congress. So their support of newsprint or media or new, newspapers in this case in general is 15%. The liberals, they're tied to the president. They like their president. You know, he, again, media is in the back pocket of the president. So even though it's down, it's still doubled that. However, both numbers are dismally low. I mean, 34% is really low, even for liberals. Um, yeah, you know, I'm, more and more I'm becoming convinced it's not a left-right issue. People just in general – now, you might have one group who's a little bit higher than the other group. But in general, people just are, don't believe the, the, the BS anymore. Yeah, I don't think that they do either. I think that we're all just really getting sick and tired of it. I have – I don't think there's any, like I said, there's no candidate out there who's going to represent every single person and all their views. So there's going to be somebody in office, and I think everybody is seeking somebody who represents them. And when you have a group of people that nobody wants, they get sick and tired of the, of the mess and the jokes. I'm tired of the right left paradigm. I'm sick and tired of people saying, just as long as a Republican wins, no, no. It's time for the games to stop. Let's actually put something in place that represents every person, which is taking care of your, yourself. Well, you know, with only 30 minutes left, I would just want to make sure that we move on because there's the one story about the privatized city we want to talk about. And also there's the new tax bill that we wanted to talk about. I had both of those in mind. I'm glad you brought those up. Um, I do want to talk first about – the privatized city. Now, I am going to take pride in this article, not because I live here, but because I do live about 30 minutes from, from the city. This is a city here in Georgia. It's called Sandy Springs. Um, it's got parks. It's got roads. It's got a beautiful, place to, it's a beautiful place to live. It is a very pretty area. They take very good care of it. And what surprised me about that is that everything 
almost everything in the city on a city level is privatized. Okay, so they in 2005, they outsourced almost all the functions of city government with the exception of police and fire to a single company which runs the town. The company is in charge of running all the vital functions of government from running the parks to paving the roads, even 911 calls. And they said there are zero backlogs in permit requests. Can you imagine that? Zero backlogs in permit requests. That's unheard of. That's absolutely unheard of. Yeah, that's, and then it, that's rare. Go ahead. Well, it says you call the city and I you'll said, be that's surprised. Rare. You know, it's funny. I've actually it's, been to this city because I'm looking at a picture from the, the article. I, I stayed mm-hmm. at a hotel right down from those two buildings because I thought they were such bizarre buildings. I noticed them. I stayed in the Westin right there in front of it. Yeah, these are these are landmarks in, in City Springs now or Sandy Springs. But the interesting thing also, if you call the city, uh, you won't get placed in some call queue. You won't get an automated message. You actually get to talk to a person. Yeah, you know, I actually I have kind of mixed feelings about this article. Okay, enlighten me. Well, here's the mixed feelings I have. Okay, the problem you've got, which it seems like they've kind of – maybe this is a, a, a small problem or they've marginalized this. You have one company, which you could technically call a crony capitalist company if they get the the um, the job. Then they get all the tax revenues that would be required to pay them. Um, even though it sounds like to me from reading – when I read the article earlier, I think it was 2009 or 2011, they actually changed companies. They went with a different company. I guess that company – um, would, would bid less, and, and they said they could do just as good of a job. So they did throw it out to market competition. That's good. Um, it's pri- Most of it's privatized. That's good. The problem I still have is it's still forced taxation, and the local government there is picking a company and saying, okay, you get all this money. Under an anarchist or even a minarchist system, the government would be literally out of all those things. Private business would take care of all the – they would just be paid for like anything else is. So I kind of have mixed feelings about it because even though it's privatized, it's only quasi-privatized. It's not tr- a tr- truly private system. Here's the problem I had with the article, and it wasn't – you bring up great points. I see exactly what you're saying. I agree with what you're saying. Here's the biggest issue I had with this article. It says after talking about how you actually get to talk to a friendly person, they have a non-automated customer service hotline which fields about 6,000 calls per month. But this, it bothered me here. It also has a state-of-the-art traffic system with cameras and high-tech command center. Hmm. Okay? Yeah, that, that bothered yeah, me. Yeah, that's a good point. That bothered me very, Yeah, I'm not a big fan. Greatly. It's a good, it's yeah, a nice I'm not a area. It's a good stuff. city. But here's my question. Here's my question. Looking at this as a voluntary situation, do these people not have a choice to go somewhere else if they don't like the system? Yeah, yeah, they they do, and and honestly, like we we've talked about before, it, in a completely anarchist system, you might have a city state, and it would probably run something similar to this. Um, now, I would object to it the tax being it, it they're being forced taxation, but if you do have a right to leave and go to another city, I mean, I really don't have a problem with it. Well, here's my other question. If they're sitting here trying to save people money, they, when you said they got rid of that one company back in 2011, which they did, they saved the city over a million dollars. So if you are mm-hmm. actually hiring a company that costs less, doesn't that mean less in taxes for the taxpayers? Right, and they run surpluses every year. I mean, if you're going to have any sort of system, it seems like they figured out a pretty good way of doing it i mean if all this is true well here's the other thing i had somebody question me before if we don't have a government who's going to fix the roads who's going to pay this oh, who's going to pay that yeah i think they have figured out a way to make this happen it says that um where does it say through private oh here we go the city has repaved 147 miles of streets 874 stormwater projects and built 32 miles of new sidewalks. I guess that answers that question. Yeah, I always I love this. When you always get who will build the roads? And you always get this. And anybody talks about it. The roads will be built from 
with private companies, just like the private companies build them now, it just wouldn't – it would be without government money. It would be with private money. They would either be tolls or businesses would pay for it because, you know what, Target wants me to get from my house to Target. So maybe businesses would all chip in and pay for it. I don't know. It's like kind of like this. In a market, me and you don't have to worry about those things. And when you say, oh, God, what do you mean you don't have to worry about them? Well, do you sit around and think about – I wonder how Nike is going to get rubber to put on the soles of its shoes. How is it going to get its leather? Where do they get their shoestrings from? How is this all going to come together? You don't have to worry about that. A company creates a product, and you go and buy it. So you don't have to worry about how all the parts come together. That's what you're paying the company to do so that you don't have to. Like I don't want to sit around and have to worry about getting all these parts together to build my own shoe. That's why I go and I buy a pair of shoes. I mean, some of these arguments really, when you sit down and think, are really kind of silly. Like the whole argument about what are we going to do about the roads? Silly. <laughs> well, it says here that most people in Sandy Springs, they're happy with the change. Uh, surrounding towns and communities are trying to adopt the same model. Uh, they said it's a good worldwide model. And it says that so far their community has been pleased. They say if the polls are indicators, our founding mayor, who ran on the public private partnership platform, the PPPP. He won two terms in office with overwhelming support, and after he retired, the new mayoral candidate, Rusty Paul, not one of those Pauls, but still a Paul, uh, ran on the commitment to keep it privatized and won by a landslide. So the people are speaking, and they're answering. This is this is what they wanted. <clears throat> yeah, you know, I'd like to see that, that town as a uh, city-state. They set up their own rules and everything, and if you want to live there, fine. If you don't want to live there, leave. Yeah, so there you go. And I found that article fascinating, and also because I live so close to there. Now, I have some dissenting opinions telling me that that this, this model and this system is Agenda 21 and violates the Bill of Rights at the cost of liberty. What do you think? You know, I don't know what the hell this Agenda 21 thing is all about. I really don't, and I don't have time to either. Uh, you know, this is the problem, and God, don't take – please, people, don't take this the wrong way. But this is what happens when you end up with tinfoil hat libertarians. You get these people who are so obsessed with every little conspiracy theory. Let me just break it down for you. The conspiracy is the government is ginormous. Okay, People line up to take advantage of the power and the – the control that the government has. They do it because it's in their own self-interest. And not that there's anything wrong with self-interest, but when you add self-interest to unlimited power, you end up with corruption. This is what's going this is nothing new. It's all a conspiracy. Five people get into a room and talk about doing X, Y, or Z. It's a conspiracy. We're all conspiring at some point. Okay? Stop wasting your time with this crap. The point is the well, government is ginormous and is screwing us. We need to stop that. This, that. That's all we need to worry about. The overall structure of Agenda 21, okay, it's 300 pages divided into 40 chapters into four sections. Section one is social and economic dimensions. Um, section two is conservation of management of resources for development. Section three is strengthening the role of major groups. And section four is means of implementation. And basically this was a product of the UN Conference on Environment and Development held in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil in 1992. Okay, it's a non-binding voluntary implemented action plan of the United Nations with regard to sustainable development. So this was a plan passed by the United Nations back in 1992 and it's being force fed. And they said that it can um, be executed at local, national, and global levels. So it's Agenda 21 is very scary. This is not tinfoilish. This is legit. I mean, this is this is for real. This agenda. But but is but what's real. the solution to that and every one of those other problems? If the government is a government is of trivial importance, meaning it doesn't have any power, it can't institute these things. All the, everybody's obsessed with this and Common Core and everything else, but you're dealing with the symptoms. The cause is the government has this much power that it can do these things. So focus your energy on limiting the government's power. It, then it can't do these things. So that what happens is it's like these people who are obsessed with the Fed. And I mean I, I do not like the Fed at all. 
But the conspiratorial side is all oh, these people met in secret. They all read the Edward G. Griffin book. And I, I don't, I don't doubt that the guy, what the guy wrote in, 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 in Creature from Jekyll Island is absolutely true. But I'm not obsessed yeah, with it. These that. men all gotten, you know, what's that? I own that. I own that book. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I haven't read the book, but I've heard enough of his speeches. I mean, I, I've got the gist of it. Um, I mean, I understand what, what, what he's saying, and that's all fine and good. But the fact is, whether it was a conspiracy or not, the Federal Reserve exists now, and it's a horrible institution. And there's plenty of things that we can throw at it just based on what it does. We don't have to go back and be conspiracy theorists. And I'm not – don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that conspiracies don't exist. They absolutely exist. You've got the other uh, other side of the coin where you've got people where if you say anything, they're like, oh, that's a conspiracy theory. No, and I'm not one of those people. I'm not saying that. Like, for example, I want to know what the heck happened to Building 7. And what makes me want to know what happened to Building 7 is that nobody went to the question of what happened to Building 7. Buildings that don't get hit, hit by planes don't just fall over. Building 7 never got hit by a plane, and it fell over. Okay, that doesn't happen. I guess there's my conspiracy theory. <laughs> well, I just had uh, somebody else pose another question to me. If there's no government, what would happen to those people who need help to live, like unemployment and welfare and disability? Churches, charities, families. Like there's been through millions of years, well, not millions, thousands of years of human history, okay, people? We did it before. Oh, God, what will we do without the government? We're all going to die. I mean, this is the mentality these people have. Oh, God, we can, you know, just go ahead and kill yourself off now because you're one of the weak, okay? <laughs> you're not going to make it. You're going to drag us all down because you're weak, and you want to sit around and cry. What will we do without the government? You know, grab up oh, your balls, and, go into the forest and, and kill John a deer, drag passionate. it home and eat it. John is very passionate. I'm sorry. Week. John. Calm down. Larry is not on the line. Calm down. <laughs> Calm down. Oh, I wish Larry well, would call back and have a real debate with me. If we're on that subject, instead of just you guys, disparage me, no, like actually no. talk to me. You guys, yeah, you guys will have to do that on a night that I'm not here. Could you imagine a two-hour episode of you and Larry going at it? That would be not an episode I'd want to listen to, but hey. <laughs> Um, but you hey, know, and we would have to set some ground rules, like no disparaging remarks about the other person. Stick to the topics. It is a dialogue. People are allowed to ask questions. There should be some back and forth. We would definitely need a mediator. We would need like a, oh. a, a, a what, what do they call that in the debate? A mediator. No, it's not called a mediator in a debate. I don't know it's like what the host called. of the debate. Right, well, it's kind of like a mediator. mediator. Well, anyway, we'll go. We will go anyway. on now. Uh, I, you know, we need to take a quick commercial break. We're gonna. I'm gonna play some commercials, and when we get back, we will discuss the article you have been dying to talk about because it is the best. It really is awesome. So, we will That's talk funny. about that. It is, and we'll talk about it when we come back right after these messages. Hi, this is the Wolfman, and this is. A.D. Venture. Join us as we host the Barefoot Bushcraft Radio Show. Every Saturday at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 2 p.m. Pacific. You'll learn about primitive skills, survival techniques, equipment and gear. We'll also discuss useful tips and tricks, product reviews, and even have a few special guest appearances. Join me, the Wolfman... And me, A.D. Venture, for the Barefoot Bushcraft Radio Show. Right here on Freedomizer Radio, every Saturday at 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. Oh, you want to heal the world? Oh, you can't, you can't do that. You know, you've got to elect the right people. No, change your thinking. Change the way you feel. Change the way you do things. Do everything for peace. Like John Lennon said, walk for peace. You take a shower for peace. Do whatever you do for peace. Every time, Every time you, you do that, do that you, 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 set you set a ripple, ripple effect, effect out. Because we, we live in a, a vibrational world, and your brain is the instrument. To, to learn how to direct and control your mind, you guys are, are superheroes. You know, They don't want you to know that, but you are. 
you guys are the most powerful people in the world. We see the power in you to change your thinking. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday, only on Freedomizer Radio. Greetings, this is Blake the Eccentric, and I want to invite you to check out my new show on Freedomizer Radio, The Eccentric Perspective. It's sort of a red pill, blue pill, going down the rabbit hole kind of show, featuring outside-the-box politics, philosophy, and gonzo journalism. But be warned, with knowledge comes responsibility, and you might not see the world the same way again. As I will attempt to open your mind, speak to your common sense, and challenge your critical thinking skills. So please join me Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday from noon to 1.30 Pacific Time. Once again, that's Eccentric Perspective, only on Freedomizer Radio. Okay, and we're back. And provided that John is not having any more technical difficulties on his end, I will say this very quickly <clears throat> I don't before think, we get in. I will say this before we get into I don't into think I'm having article. any technical difficulties. Can you hear me? Uh, Maybe I am. <laughs> I can. I can hear you right now, but you were breaking in and out on some of the things you were saying throughout the show. So, um, well, I was just listening. Here. The commercials are breaking in and out too. I don't think it's me. I think it's, it's something to do I, with. Um, I heard the no, commercials. No, I, I don't clearly. think it's to do. Huh, okay. Well, I thought maybe it had to do with something with the streaming service. No, but I will say that I, I want to throw this out there really well, quickly. Well, the Time Warner cable sucks. Great. Okay, I'm going to throw this out there well, really quickly. That <laughs> next after our show is the Proof Negative show on from 9 to 12 Eastern, and that is 6 to 9 Pacific. So everybody stay tuned. Um, Proof, I'm sure, has some fascinating things to talk about, if not some interesting guests tonight so um stay tuned after this and listen to him for the next three hours it'll be fantastic so let's you know on that note we we talked about having more guests and we haven't done that i guess we're so darn interesting we don't need guests well you and i have a good time on the air so it's it's not really hard um but we do need to get some people um, to join in. Well, you know, just throwing the, this out there, I'd love to talk to the guy from the, your friend that you brought on from the Free Island Project. That was a fun yeah. conversation. I need to get Stephen back on the air because things things also have changed a little bit since he was last on. He ought to my do his own show. My political views took a big old U-turn, so we do need to have him come back on because I think I'd have even more of a greater appreciation for his project, but. I will talk yeah, to him and see if we, if we can get him on, certainly. So I'm going to let you take the reins and discuss the last article because you posted it. You're excited about it, so just go for it. All right, this brilliant congressman. I don't even know where this guy's from or who he is. He's outgoing, I know that. He has decided that there should be a new tax bill, and the new tax bill should allow us, the people, to give the same lame, crappy excuses. Tell me how brilliant this is that uh, the IRS just gave for uh, losing emails. So basically, we can file some of our taxes, and if we get audited, if this bill passes, then we could just say, sorry, IRS, our hard drive crashed. It's not our fault. Our dog ate those receipts. It's not our fault. So I thought that was kind of brilliant. It's called the Dog Ate My Tax Receipts Act. (laughs) (laughs) And the excuses... And the excuses are convenient, unexplained, miscellaneous computer malfunction, traded documents for five terrorists, and forgot in case of guns sold to Mexican drug lords. Well, nothing makes me laugh more (laughs) as an educator. Oh, the dog ate my homework is the traditional excuse when anybody doesn't have any homework, even though it's tongue-in-cheek now. But this this is hilarious. I am... This is another way, I'm convinced this is another way that they are sticking it to the quote-unquote the man by making this bill. They know that they're liars. They know that they could magically make these emails reappear if they wanted to. They're certainly not smeared and totally removed from from the databases wherever they're located. So they could pull them up if they want to, but they're not. Well, I love that the, the, um, the acceptable excuses are unexplained miscellaneous computer malfunction – Traded documents for five terrorists and forgot in gun case sold to Mexican drug lords. 
So all those, of course, are the Obama administration's, like, you know, it's their scandals. He traded, you know, um, those five terrorists, and then they had the, the, the um, Fast and Furious. And so I thought that was kind of tongue-in-cheek and kind of funny. This guy is awesome. This guy is awesome. They all know that we're trying, they're trying to pull the wool over our eyes. This guy is awesome. Anybody who believes they really lost the emails has to be out of their mind. Well, I mean, heck, just call up the NSA. I mean, I these people are really – what's that? Yeah, I, I think that my favorite excuse is received water damage in the trunk of Ted Kennedy's car. Say that again? There's a list down here. It says, unless the IRS produces the documents that were subpoenaed, taxpayers shall be given the benefit of the doubt when not producing critical documentation if their excuse is one of the following. The dog ate my tax receipts. Number two, convenient, unexplained, miscellaneous computer malfunction. Number three, traded documents for five terrorists. Number four, burned for warmth while lost in the Yukon. Number five, left on the table in Hillary's book room. Number six, received water damage in the trunk of Ted Kennedy's car. <laughs> Number seven, forgot, forgot in gun case sold to Mexican drug lords. Number eight, forced to recycle by municipal green czar. Number nine, was short on toilet paper while camping. And at number 10, at this point, what difference does it make? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, he even, he even threw in there, he says, in any case, the IRS can see the NSA for a good, high-quality copy. Stockman snarkily stated at the end of the bill. <laughs> I love that word, snarky. This is, this is legit. Even the guys in the government are saying this is ridiculous. This is foolish, and this is ridiculous. They know where the emails are. They could produce them. Look, my stepdad is an IT guy. He always says there's always a, f- a footprint. There's always a trail. So you can lose yep. all the emails you want to, but you can reproduce them if you really want to because there's a file of them somewhere. Oh, yeah. Well, especially if it's email. Even if they're stored on your hard drive, they're stored typically server-side somewhere on some server. It's typically how it works. Now, I don't know what kind of computer system they've got there. But uh, did you see the picture of John um, Cosk? How do you say his name? The guy who's the head of the IRS? Um, Koskinen? 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 He I looks evil, doesn't he? He does. I'm sorry. I, just, like, I think all these guys he- look evil. Yeah, but you know what? If you put a mustache on him with a top hat and a monocle, he would look like um, Uncle Pennybags from Monopoly. Oh, is that what that guy's called, Uncle Pennybags? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Pennybags. Mm-hmm. But wouldn't he look like the no, Monopoly? Uh, yeah, he kind of does. I'm, I'm sorry, I got distracted because I'm on um, Daily Mail, and on the sidebar... They've got this thing, Entertainment Weekly picture of Charlie Theron and um, and Tom Hardy in the new Mad Max movie. I didn't even know they were making a new Mad Max movie. When did that happen? I missed that. Did you know that? No, and I, I don't care. <laughs> I just don't care. You don't remember the old Mad Max movies? Well, I think it's funny because when you said you were mentioning um, Charlie Theron. I was about to laugh and say, what is this? Is he about to say how hot she is or something? No, I'm not a Charlie Theron guy. I've never have been. I'm, I thought she was cute, but it was never like, oh, she's, no, yeah, uh, no, nothing. Oh, but I see what you're saying. She cut off all her hair, and she's, it's really dark now. You know, forgive yeah, me for being like, ignorant. Um, she, oh, forgive me for being ignorant. Well, she but looks I don't like a, what's her face? What is Mad Max? The, old, the, the stories with Mel Gibson about a post-apocalyptic future. You don't remember those? They came out in the 80s. No, I don't. And the whole economy's collapsed, and everybody's like a road warrior, and it's, it's anarchy. You have not seen that? Yeah, never, never mind. Oh, it's You're their a definition boy. of anarchy. It's their definition of right, anarchy. Right, it's chaos, but they would call it anarchy. But yeah. Yeah, so, that's, yeah it, that's not anarchy. Right, correct. But yeah, so and I'm I'm surprised. I I actually would not go see this, but I love Tom Hardy. I think no matter what the guy does, he is brilliant. Brilliant. I don't know who that is. 
Uh, did you ever see Lawless with him and Shia LaBeouf? No. And uh, who else was in that? Oh, fantastic film. Came out like uh, a couple years ago. I'm trying to remember who else was in that. It was a good one. Tom Hardy is fantastic. He also played Bane in the new uh, Batman, in the last Batman film. Okay, well, while I know what Batman is, that is a little better. But these are, I guess, I don't know. I'm not a big movie watcher, and I'm not a big current movie watcher. Oh, I see, I love film. Always have. But, you know, I mean. Well, there's some ones you, you recommended to me. What was that one movie that you had me watch that I really enjoyed? Um, the Wonder Boys, right? Yeah? Oh, Wonder Boys. Oh, I forgot. It's Guy Pierce and Gary Busey also is in Lawless. It's insane. All These the people in that, in I'm that film. I'm going to have to check out. I'm going to have to check yeah, it out. So, I will. It's about two brothers who during Prohibition become bootleggers. And oh, basically in the that town, really the government comes in and says, if you want to be able to bootleg, that's fine, but you got to pay us off. And he's like, I'm not paying any of you off, but I'm still going to bootleg. And so that's what the whole film is about, these two brothers. It's it's fantastic. And there's so many good people in this movie. I think that's really interesting. I'm going to have to certainly take a look at that. Watch it. Netflix it. Oh, I will. Netflix. Netflix. I like Netflix. Um, my roommate has a Netflix account, and we'll we'll have to watch it together. But um, there yeah, you I don't go. watch a lot of TV. I don't watch a lot of movies. And we know your solution to television. You don't watch it either, but we know your solution. You've mentioned it twice. Yeah. <laughs> Download it. Download it. I'll have to. Yep. I'll certainly have to give that a shot. There's a lot that I'm learning in my transition to um, vol- voluntarism and. Um, in, in anarchy and and all that. So you know, I'm. Did you finish the learning. law? Have you finished that yet? No, I haven't. I'm still. I have it in my hands. I just need to sit down. And I'm going to call you out was, every week on it and and see what kind of pathetic excuse you give me. Sorry, John. My dog ate the, the, my book. No, I don't have a bill. I don't with. have a bill for that. I don't have a bill for that. So I'll tell you. I'll make this. I'll make this agreement with you that. By this time next week, I will have finished it, and I will message you. Oh, so when eighty I pages. It. Yeah, and I'll message you exactly when I finish it too, and then we can talk about it. All right. Well, this weekend I will be away in Alabama. Gee, Alabama—that's the land of excitement. Well, it's a, the, a buddy of mine is, is well, you know, Michael from SNN. Um, he's heavily involved in the. Um, the um, now I'm drawing a blank here. The League of the South, and they're having their national conference. So we are driving down Thursday night, and it's two days. It's Friday and Saturday, and so we're gonna hang there in Alabama and uh, have a good time, talk to people, and have fun. And they're gonna be all Southern nationalists, and I'll be the crazy anarchist, and we'll get in all kinds of great debates, and it'll be a blast. <laughs> well, hopefully you won't run into Larry there. Is Larry in Alabama? I thought he was in Texas. No. He's in Texas. I'm just teasing. But I also want to give a shout-out to my friends at Pork Fest this week. I'm sad I had to miss Pork Fest this year, but the Porcupine Freedom Festival takes place in New Hampshire, the Free State Project. So hopefully I will get to meet up with them next year. Um, we do have only about a minute left in the show. So I want to remind everybody to listen to Proof Negative coming up next for the next three hours of Everything Fascinating. Um, He and his host, I don't know his Wednesday night's host name. I probably should get to know her. But I hope everybody listens. Uh, We're going to end off with a song called There is Love. It is by our friend um, Harrison Ray. And we hope you had a great week. Please listen again tomorrow on the Voluntary Virtues Network on YouTube. Everybody take care. Thank you.